Yeah, so Paul's a radio host at WA 1320 AM and also does um, sports there as well. Um, local sports, high school sports, uh, broadcasting um, on radio, TV, internet, kind of like video, internet, YouTube, yep. they call it these days. Um, and uh, he's uh, from around here, he's from Central Mass. Yeah, grew up so, in Westboro, started at WORC in Worcester. Yeah. yeah. So why don't you just introduce yourself and, uh, you know, you can take this however you want to take it. Yeah. And I'll, at some point, I'll, um, I'll follow along, I'll bring up questions. Are you you're recording? Okay. All right. I just shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Let's All right. Yeah. Uh, as you said, uh, Paul Healy grew up in Westboro, Mass. Uh, graduated uh, high school in 1976 and then went to the Harvard of Southeastern Mass, Bridgewater State College, finest school in a 30 mile radius, and that includes Brockton High. Um, where I was a communication arts and science major. Went there intending to get into uh, radio and TV, but somehow got wrapped up in the uh, theater concentration. So spent uh, my first four years doing that. Uh, went to New York to uh, try to make it as an actor. If you want to work in theater, work in the technical side. You know, props, sound, lights, those are the people who actually are employed and can make a living in that. Um, I came home in 1981, started working in uh, insurance claims, and then in uh, 1986, started, uh, that's when I first got involved in broadcasting. Uh, how it started, uh, Peter Gay, who's now at North TV, he was, no, he was in Attleboro then, but uh, called me up and said, uh, Heels, we need, we need a sideline reporter for the big Thanksgiving Day football game. And I said to Peter, a sideline reporter for high school football, that's a bit much, isn't it? And he said, it pays 50 bucks. And I said, what time's kickoff? Um, so that's how that started, uh, and then the next year I started uh, broadcasting high school football at Central Mass. And then, just so you know how unintelligent I am, um, I'm doing a lot of sports talk radio in the Worcester area, uh, down in the Attleboro area, and that's when I decided if I'm going to be on radio, I want to do more than, you know, I love sports, but I want to do more than just talk about games. I want to talk about stuff that really matters. So that's when I got out of sports talk radio, I got into regular radio, and then right after that, Sports Talk took off, and it's now the number one talk radio format in every single major city in America. And now I'm in regular radio, and basically the last left winger on AM radio, which is dominated by conservative voices. So I just want you to understand, when you graduate college, I hope you make better career decisions than I did. Um, I feel we'll get something, but keep going. Okay. Um, but uh, right now, uh, so I worked uh, um, the, the closest to ever making it to the big time is when um, I was working with Frank Foley, who's now the morning guy on 105, what's the, WXLO uh, here in Worcester, 104.5, that's it. He's the, on the morning guy with uh, Jen. Um, but uh, so we had a show on the F&B radio network. We were on uh, WORC in Worcester a station up in Fitchburg and a station um, down near Webster. And uh, that was uh, basically an entertainment comedy show, fast moving show, pretty funny. Then we got picked up by WCRN, which is a 30 a.m. in Worcester, which is a 50,000 watt station, and uh, did that for a few years. And it was a very, it was a very, very funny original morning show. Uh, the theme was uh, real life, real radio, uh, moved very quickly. and. Uh, didn't take anything seriously. And we're right on the cusp of making it the big time. And uh, well, substance has gotten away and the whole thing crashed and burned. Um, and Frank, you know, he, he's publicly talked about it. He's doing great now, uh, but, but thing. So then uh, Frank left and Peter Blute, who was a former uh, Republican congressman uh, here in Massachusetts, two terms, uh, he had the seat that Jim McGovern now holds um, uh, years ago. Uh, and he had major, he was on WRKO, which was, uh, WRKO in the 70s and 80s was one of the biggest talk radio stations in the country. Um, so then Peter uh, replaced Frank, and then it became a much more political show. Um, and uh, I was the token liberal on the show. So, uh, and that, that was okay for a couple of years. Has anyone ever seen the movie Office Space? You have? Okay. I made a mistake, I thought that was a documentary. 
not an entertainment film. And what happens in office space is there's one employee who um, just has an unbelievably apathetic attitude. So when they bring in a consultant, which is Latin for a guy who used to have your job till he got fired, um, when they bring in a consultant, he is the only one in the entire office who has the guts or doesn't care enough to BS him uh, to tell him the truth. And in the movie, he becomes the hero. Yeah, yeah, see? Dave knows. So in the movie, he becomes the hero. And again, I thought this was a documentary. So when WCRN brought in this consultant uh, to try to improve the ratings and stuff, uh, I basically pushed back on everything he recommended because I wanted to keep my own individuality and not sound like everyone else on the radio. And so I leave thinking, you know, I'm going to be the hero because I told the consultant the truth. And three days later, I was fired. Um, but so that's the difference between real life and documentaries. Um, yeah. yeah. Then matriculated down uh, to Attleboro and again started doing sports there, then started filling in, and then got my own show, which I do now, which is Pontificating with Paul and the Proletariat, which is a radio show and a parody of same. There it is. Uh, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. till noon. Um, I guess to give some kind of example, uh, when Stephen Colbert uh, did his character, The Stephen Colbert Show, which was a parody of, of himself. Um, it's ADD radio, it moves very, very fast. Unlike regular talk radio, we don't pick one subject and pound it for the entire hour. Uh, we cover about, what'd you say, 37, 38 subjects an hour? Yeah. It's, it, it really moves. Um, try to keep it as more of an entertainment show, but occasionally, uh, again, the show's on from nine till noon. Uh, and being the last left winger left, on a AM radio, with the exception of our weekend guy, Dave Kane. Um, I try to keep the political stuff to the last half hour of the show so I don't completely lose my audience because AM radio now, is, it, it's the bedroom of extreme conservative right-wing talk. So if you want to have anyone listening, uh, you can't alienate basically the entire people who normally listen to AM radio. Um, I mean, when you have like 25 listeners, yeah, 25. Nonsense. Nonsense. I have about 25 remote correspondents. But they say that only one out of 100 people who listen to radio even consider calling in or texting in. So for every caller, that's equal to about 100, 100 listeners on, on radio. So because I'm on during working hours, 9 till noon, I take fewer phone calls and I take a lot more texts, which can be difficult on a flip phone, but we make it work. Um, and we give the uh, text, we call our texters remote correspondence because it sounds more impressive. And you guys are going to be too young to get this. And we give them agent numbers because we're huge fans of the show Get Smart. Have any of you ever heard of that show Get Smart? Okay, that was a show, a TV show in the 60s. Uh, Mel Brooks, you've heard of Mel Brooks, right? The satirical movies, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, History of the World. You know, I was like how ignorant I was, the story about how ignorant I was of yeah. Mel Brooks stuff. Yeah. So I worked on it. So one of, there's an actress from Young Frankenstein, Clovis Leachman, and uh, she worked on a film I worked on, and she came into, like a lot of times when you work on films, they, they use church basements as like the dining hall, and she walks into the church basement, and Deborah Messing, and Deborah Messing starts like cla slow clapping. She's like, everybody, Clovis Leachman. I was like, is Clarice Leachman? I had like no idea. And then, you know, I tell anyone like older than me, like, I can't believe you didn't know who Clarice Leachman was, you know. But, Former Miss America, great actress yeah. who could do, uh, yeah. she could do anything, anything from serious drama to hysterical comedy. Sorry. To anyway, you. but, um. Yeah. So, okay, can we just, on the, on the, um, remote correspondent thing, can you yeah. talk a little bit about, I know it's kind of taking you out of your intro yeah. for a second, but. The importance of um, and the unique part of uh, of radio, yep. AM or talk radio, where you can actually have that involvement back and forth, well, but there's actually like people can talk back, people can have interest yeah. into what they. Which is no big deal uh, to you guys because now there's the, what I call the interweb because I'm a bit of a luddite, uh, and you have social media, and every, you can communicate with anyone you want all over the world in seconds, and before that. Radio was the only way to do it. Um, and just to go back culturally, you know, first there was the sky at night. You told stories about the sky, and there was only the spoken word. Um, and that's how people communicated. So you can only communicate within your own group or your own village. Uh, and then the written word is invented. And for the first time in human history, you can communicate with people 
um, outside of your cultural group um, with a written word. Um, then the telegraph comes, and the telegraph, you know, through the wires, that's the first time you can communicate with people, you know, miles and miles and miles, hundreds of miles away from you. And then in the 1920s, radio was invented, and by the 1930s, uh, radio, um, it just a complete revolution in human communication. And the sound, you know, no wires, tr you, could, you could broadcast a signal through the air. And the way that works is, well, I have no idea how that works, but you could communicate with people far, far away. And radio became the way, uh, the way the presidents communicated with the nation. Um, and it was, it was broadcasting because you had everything from important political, serious political stuff um, to uh, uh, shows about, you know, uh, yard sales in every single community, WTAG, 580, and WORC with the big ones in Worcester, every single community had their own local radio station. And it was a big deal. That's how businesses advertise themselves. And that, what, what you guys use for social media today, that was social media. Um, and that's when call-in shows started. And it was the first time in human history you could have an exchange of ideas between, with people from unbelievably different backgrounds. And it's, the reason it's called broadcasting is because you, you covered a broad um, array of topics, um, everything from sports to politics to local news, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, comes 1987, and uh, there was a thing called the fairness, <clears throat> excuse me, the fairness doctrine. Have you covered that at all? Does anyone know what the fairness doctrine was? <laughs> What's your name? Dylan. Give it a shot. What's the fairness doctrine? The fairness doctrine was that all reasonable positions on any given issue had to be given equal time uh, mm -hmm. on the air. You're wrong, you idiot. Who's your teacher? No, I'm sorry. That's, uh, no, that's absolutely correct. So when you were discussing a political issue uh, of some nature, again, you had, to, you had to cover all aspects of it. And uh, talk shows had some of them, you know, David Brudnoy was on WBZ, Gene Burns was on WRKO, and you know, two of the most brilliant minds in, in, you know, ever born. Um, and, and you have unbelievable exchanges of ideas and learning about things via talk radio. Um, and again, because if you had um, an extremely conservative host talking about a subject, you also had to have someone either moderate or, or extremely liberal talking about the subject, so the audience didn't have to agree with one side or the other, agree with whoever you want, um, but you at least were presented with the ideas from the whole spectrum on that issue. And then came the elimination of the Fairness Doctrine in 1987 during the Reagan administration, and that changed everything. Because now, that changed radio, especially AM radio, from... TV yeah, TV too. But, but again, TV didn't have as much Talk radio, uh, talk radio kind of thing, exchange of ideas that, yeah. that radio had. Uh, but it changed radio from broadcasting to narrow casting. Now you would find a niche, you would find one group to appeal to, and that's you who would, you would hammer your message home to. Um, and then came syndication. Instead of having uh, every local community with their own local personalities, their own local shows, uh, then came syndication um, and the first major success was Rush Limbaugh and the Excellence and Entertainment uh, Network, which made lying for a profession acceptable. Um, and it slowly transformed AM radio into a, an area where ideas from all over the forum, all over the spectrum were discussed to, uh, well, all conservative all the time, um, to which I would argue very damaging. Uh, to the country, because it used to be everybody watched a uh, half hour of local news, half hour of Walter Cronkite national news, and then we all got on with our lives. And there was one pool of facts, of, of accepted truths, one pool, and you could pick and choose your facts out of that and have your political position, whether for the Vietnam War or against the Vietnam War, but we're all operating with the same set of facts. Um, in, in court cases, there's a thing uh, each side will agree to stipulate certain facts for a trial. So we all agree that these are the basic truths. So there was uh, all kinds of things that were stipulated to be true. And then you could form your own opinion off of that. Um, now we've reached a point, um, I think there are three gifts to mankind 
uh, from the devil himself. I don't really believe in the devil, but if I did, uh, the three gifts he gave to mankind are plastics, which are very convenient but killing us all, uh, microwave ovens, which are very convenient but killing us all, uh, and 24-7 news networks. Um, and just like uh, radio talk shows went from broadcasting to narrow casting, um, borderline propaganda, before 24-7, before cable, you had, um, again, you only had half hour local news, half hour national news, got on with your life. Um, and the major networks all had news because it was considered a public service, because a democracy can only work with an informed populace. That's how democracies work. Uh, democratic nations, the citizenry has to be smarter or it doesn't work. Um, then came 24-7 for-profit news channels. Now, uh, the networks, again, they all lost money broadcasting the news, but it was considered a loss leader. <coughs> it was for the public good. Now when you have 24-7 news, your job is not to inform. Your job is to indoctrinate to get viewers to keep coming back to your channel, to get sponsors so you can make money. And it's very good for the private companies. It is horrible for the culture. And MSNBC, which my wife is a wonderful person with two exceptions. She obviously has questionable taste in men. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, does she love to watch MSNBC. So on the left, you have MSNBC. On the right, you have Fox, or even worse, Newsmax. And their job, again, is not to inform, it's to indoctrinate and inflame. And um, one of the famous things about Fox News, which to a degree is also true about MSNBC, instead of doing stories to inform and educate people, now you're only allowed to do two kinds of stories. Stories that titillate or stories that enrage and anger you because that's what will keep you coming back. So the Fairness Doctrine ends in 1987. Now we're in 2024 and go back maybe 10 or 15 years and we've lost what is so key to a democracy, what I talked about earlier, that one pool of stipulated facts that we all agree to and could make informed opinions based on that. Now we live in a world where it's red versus blue and, and issues no longer matter. It's like, what team are you on? And for people who grow up Red Sox fans, there's nothing that could turn you into a Yankees fan. And for people who grow up Yankees fans, there's nothing that could turn you into a Red Sox fan. It's a betrayal of your family, your blood, your legacy, which is fine for sports, awful for politics. And that's where we are now. And you've got two completely, completely different set of facts. People on either side just believe completely polar things. And just one example, you know, Richard Nixon uh, resigned the presidency in 1974 because of the Watergate break-in in 1972, which was an incredible act of hubris because there's no way he could have lost that election. And I contend, and I think it's true, if Fox News or MSNBC or any of the 24-7 news channels existed in 1974, Richard Nixon never would have resigned because he never would have had to. He would have had almost half the country who believes things that aren't true. And sadly, those days are gone forever. <clears throat> Look at the last 10 years or eight years uh, of our politics. But so we're just 20, 20. Do you want to continue on this thing or do you want to talk about now? Or what do you want to do? I don't, I'm just wanna, yeah. I just want to make sure you're moving. Yeah. In the, because you want to do a lot of questions, right? Yeah, we do. So um, all right, so that's enough of that. Um, whoops. Should have done that earlier. Um, are there any clips you want to play? Well, what did you want to play? One thing I want to play, the who listens to radio thing. Well, let's, let's, all right, so we can do that, but let's... Um, because it, cause th that, that I just want to play as a demonstration okay. of how radio is how the entire country, the entire world communicated with each other. Okay. And this song is, looking back, is almost comical. Yeah. Um, but this is how big uh, radio was. I often kid Dave that he's too young for AM radio. But so they must be way too young, right? Yeah. Are we getting the audio? The audio's not coming out. Right. Idiot! Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, man. Sorry. <laughs>
Did you just go to point to it? All right, so here's the song. What do you want to say about the song? Well, just this is it's just a one minute yeah. demonstration of, of how, and this song was used uh, by owners of radio stations to try to get people to sponsor on their stations. Because uh, this, this is how you reach the public. Not with magazines or newspapers, radio. Real toe tapper. And that's even before they invented FM radio, which had your cool, laid back, mellow DJs that brought us music. Uh, so that's a lot of people, hey? Yeah, 150 million uh, every day. Yeah. I'd be making real money if that was still the case. By the way, Sarah Vaughn, brilliant jazz singer, and Stan Freeberg, he's the one who wrote that. If you ever want to look, um, look back at about 50 years ago, what people considered really, really funny satire, uh, look up some Stan Freeberg stuff on YouTube. It's pretty funny, but anyway. Right, um, so can I just show uh, just... Um, who's in control here? No, yes, of course you can. I just wanted to show uh, the Paul's show. Like, so, obviously, so the radio station is not just over the air. Also, they, they, everything goes online. Um, it goes on TuneIn Radio, but plus it also broadcasts out of the website, or they have an app, right? Yep. Um, and, which so doesn't work on my flip phone. Listen to wherever, right? So that's something you have to do with radio now. It's something that's helped with radio, yep. right? Uh, where people can listen to it wherever. I don't know if any of you guys have like tune-in radio on your on your phone or in your uh, car play or whatever. Um, you can just listen to it. We also uh, never had to compete with much. podcasts. Podcasts you listen to whenever you want. Yeah. Before podcast, you had to listen when your show was on, and if you missed it, that's it. So, you missed it. So here's Paul's. Uh, very, they, they don't put a lot of effort. <laughs> this is a show page on this yeah. WordPress website. All right, so the very, very deadly community. serious look. That's their slogan. It's all about community because they're a community radio station, yeah. right? Uh, they're not about. Uh, they're not profit, so they don't actually sell ads. It's all underwriting. Uh, so uh, organization like businesses can sponsor stuff, but you can't actually make a direct sale or any of that kind of stuff. Or you can't. Them. You know, we. Uh, you know, thank you for. Yeah. Thank you for Dave Angel Auto uh, helping us sponsor this yeah. broadcast, as opposed to for-profit radio, where, you know, Dave Angel Auto Sales, greatest car company in the history of the world. If you want a great deal, come see Dave Angel. Can't do that on uh, non-profit stations. And again, the motto of the station is all about community. The motto for my show is anything but average. Uh, when the show is good, it's very, very good. When it's bad, it's utter drivel. But at least it's never average. So 9 to noon every weekday yep. for Paul's show. And then he has archives on here. But, oh, um, no, they're pretty good. They're, oh, yes, there's, yeah. yes, there's up there. Okay. I was going to say it's probably not very updated, but it's updated. I'm no. sorry. I'm sorry. All right. Um, you can have a show. Apply for a show. <laughs> yeah. If you want to have a show, you have to get down to Attleboro to yep. do a show. But, um, and there's even comics here. Uh, and then they have a listen live thing. You can actually listen to what's on the radio right now. Might as well do it. See what's on. This should be adult. It's probably just music, right? Yeah, sure. music right now. So they don't have a show right now. Yeah. It's just music. Yeah. But is that playing? Oh, Comcast. Comcast is working outside the studio. Oh, so, so we're off the air to like four o'clock this afternoon. Okay, never mind. We better okay. get on before the basketball game tonight at six o'clock. Attleboro's heading all the way up to Springfield right, really? to play Putnam. Uh, Volk Regional. Okay, so that's yeah. Right, that's not happening. Sorry. All right. Um, but yeah, that's just that's just saying. There's a uh, there's a mobile app you can download and you can listen to this on TuneIn Radio. There's no WRF yeah. 1320. But two of my all-time favorite talk show hosts because they were so intelligent and so informative. I mentioned them earlier: David Brugnoy and Gene Burns. May they rest in peace. And my show is absolutely positively nothing like theirs. Um, yeah. uh, we jokingly call it ADD radio, which works, multiple topics, we move fast, we try to be more entertaining um, than serious. Occasionally, um, 
I'll alienate a good deal of the audience when we'll get very, very serious politically. But again, I try to do that at the end of the show so we can enjoy each other's company for two and a half hours uh, before I tell you what I really think <laughs> uh, politically and about the, well, the orange pile of excrement, our 45th president. So yeah, so um, they're also on TuneIn, like I said, which is an app like, like a lot of people mm -hmm. use to listen to radio. Um, and uh, the next radio show is the Old Time Radio Showcase, which is by me, hosted by me. Yeah. Um, and it's just like I do it ahead of time. It's not, yeah. I don't have to be there in person. I just edit it all together. Yeah. I play old radio shows, and then I, I just do intros for all of them. Mm -hmm. Because before TV, yeah. all the detective shows, the spy shows, the westerns, that was all yeah. over the radio. And you would imagine what the characters looked like. So Dave does all the narration for that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to spare you any of my, I, I have some very serious clips, yeah. which will spare you. We'll just do one more lighthearted clip. Um, back when, oh, hold on, yeah. Back when I was your boy, um, you walked to school or you took the bus. That was it. And nobody got driven to school because well, parents had lives to lead, and every parent was happy if their kid was an average healthy child. And those days are gone forever. You want to insult a parent now, call them average. Call their kid average, which our parents in our day would be thrilled because we had big families and stuff. Now, nobody walks to school or takes the bus. Everyone gets driven to school in SUVs. And, well, as this is going to show, you have this parade of SUVs, and it's something I just don't understand. So this is just a short, more comical clip. He's out in, okay. Nowadays, you have the parade of SUVs out in front of our schools. What is it, folks? Really? It's the parade of SUVs because none at all. My child is too gifted and special to be trusted to sit in a bus driven by Heather Parika. I have to <laughs> drop them off myself in my giant gas guzzling SUV. Oh, oh, but they could get abducted. Please, first of all, your kid's not that cute. Second of all, the world is much, much safer now than it was back in the 60s and 70s when people like me were walking to school. There's only one time when it's okay for parents, okay, two times, when it's okay for parents to drive their special gifted children to school. One is when they're too sick to go to school in the first place and you don't want them to contaminate kids on the bus. The other one, science project day. Let's face it, parents, you worked really hard doing your kid's science project and you don't want it to get ruined on the bus by the other rat fink, non-gifted, not your children. Nowadays... Right. Okay, so... All right. What do you want to say about that? Nothing? You good? Move on? I guess. I you guess. Really post, you have a postscript on that one? No? A post... Well, yeah. it's a different world. Um, but, it, you know, um, you know, when we were little, you know, everyone had, you know, four, five, six. I'm one of seven kids. And, uh, again, parents... Nobody thought their kid was special, <laughs> uh, just a kid. And if they were average and healthy, they were thrilled. Those days are gone forever. Um, again, if you want to insult a parent now, tell them the kid is average. My mom uh, worked in the school system for many, many years, and she talked about how when she started teaching, you had about 5% of the kids <coughs> whose parents thought they were gifted, 5% of the kids whose parents thought they were special need, and 90% of the kids were just average healthy kids. And that, when she retired, 40% of the parents thought their, their child was gifted. 40% of their chi my parents thought their child was special needs and needs a special IEP, which in many cases kids do, but I think it's a little overdone. And you only have 20% of the parents now who are happy to have an average kid. Um, one quick rant. I'm just, all right, just be careful. Very quick. <laughs> when I graduated high school in 1976, there were 243 kids in my class at Westboro High, which was the most ever at Westboro High. 11 kids made high honors, 35 kids made the honor roll. That's 46 kids out of 243 were honor roll students. And 75% of us graduated from college. Now, the Sun Chronicle is the local paper down there, and when they print the Attleboro and Bishop Fian High School honor rolls, it is the entire page of the newspaper in tiny like six font and it's name after name after name after name. Everybody's making the honor roll because when I was a kid, if you didn't make the honor roll, the parents were mad at the kid. Now if you don't make the honor roll, they're mad at the teacher and the school for not recognizing the beauty of their gifted children. And when I was a kid, A was exceptional, 
Uh, B was above average, C was average, and was a perfectly acceptable grade. If your kid came home with a C and a one or a two in effort, fine, no problem. Go ahead, try to give a kid a C now. So it's my argument that instead of printing the honor roll, which takes up the whole page, just print the f names of the four or five kids who didn't make the honor roll. And maybe that'll motivate them. But that's my old crusty curmudgeon, curmudgeon viewpoint. Okay. I'm just going to argue back with like, I mean, I think if I were to teach a history class, yeah. US history, and most students only remembered 75% of what I said, I'd be like, damn, I didn't do a good job. That's a C. Right? So okay. Say, so, all right, all right, move on. Move Miss on. Spinney was the greatest yeah. teacher I ever yeah. had in social studies and history. Right. She gave plenty of C's. Yeah. No, I get, I get what you're and saying. believe me, nobody she gave her any back C's, time. They earn C's. Yes. So, so, but when students earn A's, you give them A's. Yeah. You know, so that's, 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 that's I'm just saying, Dave, in, in the 1960s, <laughs> in the 1960s, 11% of Harvard students got an A in any course. 11%. Okay. Okay? Now it's 60% have A averages. Something's changed. We don't have to go to like the, the highest level. I mean, you're just talking elementary school, so. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, all right, so let's, I wanna go, I wanna talk, you haven't really talked too much about like your experience. So I just wanted okay. to give, you were talking about like the history of radio yep. as like from this macro level. I wanted to hear like the micro, like Paul Healy. So okay. Can you talk about the places you've worked, just for like 10 minutes, okay. talk about the places you've worked, what it was like, and where you are now. And just okay. Kind of, up. Well, I did a little bit of that, and again, yeah, started with a sports, uh, missed a phone call, started with, uh, you know, sports radio, then broadcasting games, uh, filling in at sports talk shows, and then doing sports talk shows, and I explained, then, you know, if I'm going to be on radio, I want to talk about stuff that really matters, the way my heroes, uh, David Brudnoy and Gene Burns did, who are much better than I am, and I, when I started, I was uh, very standard, very basic, um, stay in your lane, a color between the lines, that kind of thing. And long story short, too late um, to where it's evolved now. Yeah. It's, I'll if you could like, it's any, like, like not go long story short. So like give, no. give a little bit more story of each of the places you've been. Okay. That's what I'm saying. All right, so I started at WORC in uh, Worcester. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, first filling in and then becoming part of the Frank Foley show, which was a, a, a fast moving comedy show. Um, should have brought some clips from that because some of those will laugh out loud funny. Um, uh, we went from that to uh, WCRN, as I told you, which was you know, a big major 50,000 watt uh, station. That's when I started to develop and rely on more of my own, my own personality. And another way, and this is going to annoy Dave because <clears throat> it did last time. Um, well, you're not going to use your accents, right? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> Early in my career, I've got the ability to do a number of different voices. Everything, you know, from, you know, Marvin Martian. You know, oh, Earthling, you have made me very angry. I shall have to use my XK-47 space eliminator. You know, to, to your typical Irish accents. Or to the Australian, good day, mate. Okay, you know, to all kinds of different. And one of my uh, go-to characters, and I'm amazed at how few people during the Frank Foley show even realized they didn't realize it was me, and to me it was very obvious. But one of my go-to characters was Lance. Lance was a very, very funny character, and he would call in and he'd be, take politics very, very seriously and argue back and forth with Frank, and it was hysterical. And so one of my strengths was multiple voices. And it could be everything from Buck, the old WW2 vet, who obviously had very conservative points of view, to Ephraim, who was a retired college professor out on a disability, to Lance, who would call in and argue with Frank. Why don't you take Howard Dean more seriously? You keep picking on Dean and picking on Dean. So having different voices and portraying different people was considered a strength. Now, as you can tell from Dave, who's too young for AM radio, that's incredibly offensive, where please don't use that voice in front of my college class. They're in college. They can handle it. Uh -huh. <laughs> you don't get emails. I get emails, right? So okay. Like, are you going to get emails from people saying... Forward them to me, Dave. I'll handle them. In the appropriate voice required. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so the point is, so the show I do now, okay, it's, it's, it's all over the place. And um, I play, and someone misinterpreted this in yeah. your last class, uh, commercials. You wouldn't believe uh, how offensive uh, commercials were. And 
here I agree with Dave, yeah. these were offensive okay. in the 50s and 60s. Um, so I often play, you know, during my commercial breaks, I'll slip in old commercials from like the 1960s, husbands screaming at their wives because their coffee isn't good enough. You know, the boys make better coffee at the station on a hot plate. You know, how can a wife who's so pretty make such awful coffee? Just to kind of show as an example of how far apart we've moved. Now, one of your students misinterpreted that last semester, okay. that I try to offend people. And I'm not trying to offend people or endorse those views. I'm trying to show how far we have progressed. Because it is good, you know, it's not good to try to offend people yeah. intentionally, but everyone should be able to take a joke. Either everyone's in the pool, and we can joke about everyone or everything, or nobody is. And the intent matters more than the words. That's why I'm against banning words. Words are in inert. It's the intent behind the words that matter. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about, I mean, there's questions about it, so we'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll get to Do you want to talk a little bit about working at like a, a, a community radio station, a nonprofit radio station, and what that's like? Uh, just in general terms, and we'll get more. Yeah. Um, when you're at a community nonprofit radio station now, um, I probably more than anyone else at the station take more worldview discussions and more national issues discussions. Most people on the station keep it incredibly local. Was it something I said or something I stepped in? Or keep it um, incredibly local. Um, so I kind of break the mold there. I also, since the pandemic started, um, I live in Quincy. I work in Attleboro, but since the pandemic started, um, I broadcast from home probably three, three or four days a week now as opposed to going to, uh, to the station. And uh, my wife, Carol, who's a nurse, she's got no media experience, but she's wicked smart. Uh, she joins the show on occasion. And something from old time radio that Dave puts together at night, there was a couple called the Battling Bickersons. And it's just your typical married couple that's obviously in love with each other, but only argue with each other when they're awake. So we do a little bit of that stuff back and forth. Um, I just, it, it, again, it's a show that either annoys people, they either turn it on and say, what in God's name is this? Or it's a show that attracts people because it is so different uh, than what you're normally exposed to on the radio. Faster moving, different topics, on a good day funnier, on a bad day dribble. And I think that's enough of that. We can move on to questions or something. Yeah, we do questions. Um, so first, uh, so everyone who has, I'm going to just like take out their laptop or whatever just so you can read your questions because I'm going to have you guys read your questions that you asked. I'm going to, I have some written down which are I think are the best ones. So um, you can just have it out so then I can do it that way. Um, so um, first of all, if anyone has a question that they just want to say right off the bat. Um, the requirements for the questions were supposed to be serious and I have a non-serious question okay. I'm dying to ask you. All right. Who's your favorite WKRP character? Oh, wow, great question. My favorite WKRP in Cincinnati. Probably, you know, Cle Les Nessman, the news guy. Les Nessman, the news guy. He means well, but he can't get out of his own way. I can relate to that. Um, Chai Chai Rodriguez. Um, yeah, that's where that's from. Um, Johnny Fever is probably the most accurate character, the depiction of the wild FM music DJ back in the day. Um, there are pardon me? The, in, in the show's universe, there are I'm pretty, I'm like 99% sure. Yeah, but they changed their format from classical music. That was the whole start of the show. Yeah, they changed yeah. the format, I think, from classical music to rock and roll, um, which WBCN in Boston, 104.7. They did that in the late 60s, early 70s, and they were the most popular uh, rock and roll station in the world. And KRP was kind of based on them. And as God is my judge, I thought turkeys could fly. All right, so um, I'll ask questions from people. If I, so this is some questions that might be from people that aren't here. Okay. Like Calvin just left, had a big one, so. Um, <laughs> I've heard enough of this guy. All right. Right. See, when people change the station, I don't see them. Right. <laughs> when they get up and leave. Right. Herbert has, has like easy, like two like casual ones that I think are a good start. So Herbert, can you ask both of your questions? Just do it one at a time. So the growing up one and the morning routine one. Do you have in front of you? Yeah, so ask, ask, ask all your questions. Yep. 
where did you grow up and uh, how did it affect uh, who you became? Okay, uh, I grew up in Fantasyland. I was born in 1958, uh, so my parents had to live through the Depression and live through <laughs> World War II. Um, I was born at the height of, uh, of the middle class. And if you look through the course of human history, you normally have a small, very, very rich class, a small merchant class, and the vast majority of human beings ever born, and about 115 billion people uh, have lived. The vast majority of those people were poor and peons and struggling for the next meal and lived in the field. Then came World War II, where the entire world is blown up, except for the United States of America because of the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So America develops this incredible middle class because we're the only country in the world actually making things. And dad would go to work, and mom would stay home and take care of the kids, and we had the best schools, the best education. Um, we didn't have 24-7 news yet, so we weren't afraid of everyone and everything. Uh, I had the happiest childhood of anyone ever born, the six of seven kids. Um, I've screwed my adulthood up to a fairly well, but oh well, I had a happy childhood. Um, and so, uh, too young to fight in Vietnam, too old to fight in any of the wars after that. So I have garnered all of the benefits this country has to offer. And unlike my parents, or unlike the people who came after me, didn't have to sacrifice a thing for it. Um, so maybe, um, and, and the kids in my neighborhood, we shared everything. I mean, everything. Nothing was mine. Everything was ours. We were also so stupid, we thought we invented street hockey, but that's a different story. Um, so I think that's, um, if I, grew, if I had a more hard scrabble life where I had to fight for everything I wanted, I had to earn everything, I'd probably be a more conservative, tougher person. But my life was so positive and so wonderful. I think, how did it affect me? It's you know, made me more, I think, open-minded, um, sometimes uh, naive, sometimes too forgiving of human nature and too optimistic. But. Um, but my life was easier than yours is, and I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Or anyone in this room. Yeah. Uh, so, ask your other question, and then lead it into, like, that you show up at the radio station. All right, so, so Herbert, ask your other question. Yeah, yeah. What is your morning like, routine like? Okay. Um, uh, first thing I do is I uh, get up, I go to the bed. No, we'll skip that. Um, uh, get up, have my breakfast. Um, again, I'm such a Luddite, I, I, I don't get my news from um, social media sites because they're not social and they're sure as hell not media. Um, I'm so old, uh, we still get four newspapers a day. The New York Times, the Boston Globe, which some call the Daily Pravda, the Boston Herald, so I know what woefully ignorant white people are thinking, <coughs> Um, the Attleboro Sun, sometimes a Patriot Ledger, so four or five papers a day. So first thing I do is I'll start reading the papers. Um, I do have a couple of show prep sites online, and then I'll start making my notes. And I write down the notes of things I might want to talk about. And then the things that are highlighted in blue, uh, those are audio clips I'm going to play that day. And most of the audio clips are comic things. See, one of them is old ads. Um, um, the stuff in pink, if I'm broadcasting from home, that stuff I'm going to bring up if Carol is joining me for more of a discussion. And then once I prep, and my prep's about an hour and a half, two hours every day for a three-hour show. Um, so once you know, I get all the things that I might want to talk about that day, and then the stuff highlighted in yellow, okay, that's the stuff I'm going to start with. And, but with all that prep, the best shows are that when something comes up organically, um, that engages the audience and it, it, the texts and the phone calls start rolling in and my best shows are ones when I look at my notes the least so after spending you know an hour and a half average doing prep the best shows are when the show just rolls and the ideas just go back and forth between me and the listeners and I don't have to consult my, not, my notes much at all so the notes are more of a safety net but all right, cool. um, so, what's a good one to start with? Um, let's do. By the way, Gage is in here, right? Excuse me. Um, we'll ask that one later. Um, Blake, the one about um, 
engagement? You want to ask that question? What about uh, like the second one? Uh, it's it's about like uh, effective way to keep people engaged. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, in your own personal opinion, what is the most effective way to keep listeners engaged during long segments? Okay. You ever hear TED Talks? Yeah. TED Talks are 13 to 15 minutes long because that's the average, and people much smarter than me have done research, that's as long as most people can pay attention on one subject and stay engaged, which is why TED Talks are usually about 13 minutes long, 13 to 15, um, and which is why commercial breaks are about that far apart because the brain needs a chance to break and reset. Um, I don't know how to say this without sounding a bit egotistical. <sighs> um, uh, the reason why the Frank Foley show was so good is because Frank is a stand-up comedy guy and he still works to this day as a stand-up comedian. Set, you, know, you set up your own joke, you get your own punch. I've done stand-up before and you'd be amazed at how not good I am at it. And then there's improv comedy. And uh, there used to be a big uh, Worcester, uh, Worcester improv, which was a big deal here in Worcester. Uh, when Foothills Theater was still running, it was uh, Friday nights at 11 o'clock. Uh, and Frank and I were invited as guests. And we go on, and Frank did OK. And I killed. I just killed, because my humor is more reactive. Um, reacting on the stuff other people do, and then bringing things that were said or happened earlier back into the conversation later. And I killed that night. And I, you know, Frank and I went to high school together. And we ended that night, and Frank was like, Heels, I had no idea. So I ended up being asked to join Worcester Improv. And after a year or so, I was hosting Worcester Improv. Um, so, I'm oh, sorry, you told me not to hit the microphone, I just did. Um, uh, so my show is very, very good when I'm getting calls and texts because that's when I'm at my funniest, bouncing off other people. Um, and my show is at its worst, the utter drivel part, when I'm not getting much response from the listeners or not interacting because now I'm going to start trying too hard. And instead of making it better, it just makes it worse. So. And it's hard when, I mean, so Paul doesn't book like interview guests like a lot of Shows do. I used to do a lot more of it. I, when I was in so, the studio five days a week, I had a lot of guests. There'll be times, so he's reading people's, and he doesn't really have callers, he has texters, so yeah. he's just reading people's texts and reacting to them. Yeah. And uh, then when, when Carol comes in, it's different. You yeah. actually have someone to actually talk to. But uh, it seems pretty hard to do what you do um, as you're just like talking to yourself for three hours a day. A lot of shows, right? Yeah. So, Which is why I play more clips than most shows, or why I, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting thing. Um, let's see, who else can we talk to? Well, Calvin me... left. Um, all right, building upon that, why do you think radio stations need to stay important and relevant to their listeners, or even attracting listeners? What do you, th yeah, what do you think they need to do to 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 stay relevant and well, important to their listeners? Yeah, until the last 10 years, we never had to compete with podcasts. You only had to compete with other radio stations and, and TV. Now you have to compete with social media. You have to compete with podcasts. So one is like um, one of the sad things when I broadcast from my home in Quincy, that's it. it. It's into the ether. You hear it or you didn't. It's gone. When I broadcast from the studio, those shows are archived forever. So that's one way to engage the audience. They don't have to tune in 9 till noon. You know, if they hear I had a special guest they're interested in, they can just go to the website and listen at their convenience not mine. Um, and again, kind of arguing against myself because I work at a community station and don't spend enough time um, on the community because I'm egotistical enough. I'm not an egomaniac, but I am too self-centered. There is a difference. Um, I'm confident enough in my own abilities that I do more general national stuff than local community stuff when, for <coughs> stations like ours to survive, one of the keys is doing more local community stuff that uh, are more important to people in their everyday lives. Um, I know that, but I still insist on doing it a different way. Nice. This is a, an interesting one from Miguel. Miguel, do you want to read like both your questions that you have? Um, sure. So the first one is, Where do babies come from? No, sorry. <laughs> first one is, what is it like being a host of a radio station? And also, do you ever receive any hate, such as death threats, and how do you deal with those? 
Let me take the second one first. <laughs> uh, especially since AM radio, you, most, people most people today, you turn on AM radio expecting to hear conservative viewpoints. That's why, because that's all AM radio is now today, with very few exceptions, which is terribly sad because you end up in a bubble. Just like my wife, who is wonderful, except for her taste in men, and her adoration of MSNBC. Uh, nobody hates our 45th president more than I do, because I was raised properly by my parents, my teachers taught me properly, and my clergy taught me the right lessons. So nobody hates our 45th president more than me. But Carol watching MSNBC, come on, who's kidding whom? That's just Trump haters porn. And that's doing nothing to bring us back together as a culture. It's just keeping us divided. So I, I don't think I've ever got any serious death threats. Oh, but I get, uh, especially uh, Brian, who we've dubbed Agent 666. Uh, a week doesn't go by where he doesn't threaten to, uh, I'll clean it up for the camera, kick my fleshy hindquarters or threaten to be waiting for me when I leave the station. He never does, but he threatens. Um, so I've never got any death threats. But yeah, uh, again, if you turn on AM radio expecting to have your conservative ideas upheld, and then some guy is on there with a completely different point of view, yeah, people get very angry. Um, and there's only a couple of times. You know, but, but then again, Brian, that same guy, when the tire fell off my car, and that's another different story, I was driving the copper calamity then. Brian was the first guy who uh, volunteered to come out and help me. But I had already called AAA and I didn't need his help. So um, never any death threats. But yeah, I have annoyed people to where they've made violent threats. Whether they'd actually follow through with it or not, I hope not. And what was the first question? That was the first one. That was, oh. that was the first one. Oh, OK. Uh, you want to do your second one about the craziest thing? Yeah. yeah. And then my second one is, what is the craziest thing you've heard throughout your like, whole career like while working at a radio station? Okay. Uh, boy, I've got to be careful. Um, Jerry, will you, uh, WRKO, 680 AM out of Boston. That was the most popular talk radio station in the entire nation. Uh, that's where I first heard of General Manager earlier, Gene Burns. Very, very educated. Jerry Williams was far more of an entertainer. He was one of the most famous talk show hosts in the country. Um, when he'd get frustrated, he'd say, I'm getting out of the business. Uh, but he would do, Gene Burns would always do very, very deadly serious topics. Jerry Williams would sometimes get a little weird. And the strangest thing I've ever heard on my radio, on radio in my life, um, once a year, he would have a man on from uh, the Mambla organization. I, I, do you know what that is? Good. That's the Man Boy Love Association. Is yeah. Like a national association. A national association of adult men who enjoyed engaging in knee-knocking activities with young men, sometimes even children. And they would defend it. <coughs> and so once a year, basically, Instead of me arguing against them, let them expose their lunacy themselves. And I'm sure they picked up one or two recruits every year. And I'm sure they brought more th awareness of the horror of that issue to thousands of listeners a year. So again, instead of arguing against them, give them the airtime to express, in my opinion, your truly, truly sick and disgusting views. Yes? People who thought they could actually change their minds because their idea was they weren't taking advantage of them. These older men were showing these younger men, sometimes children, the best, safest ways to engage in a gay lifestyle. And again, this is before, you know, you didn't have any pride flags back then. Um, th this is when people hid in the closet. This is when, you know, when, again, I was in high school in 1976. The gay kids hid in the art room all day so they wouldn't get beat up. That's you know, I mean, Were you there? No, I'm saying the is using, is, the, 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 the excuse you just gave to the yeah. people in the yeah. is an excuse yes. for just being pedophiles. Yes. They're, just, they're, just, they're trying to be like, well, it's like... Um, it was self-justification yeah. of it. You're absolutely right. It's like when um, Kevin Spacey got caught like, uh, sexually assaulting people. He's like, well, you know, I just was too scared to come out. And it's like, dude, no, you're, you're a sexually assaulted man. That's different. <laughs> You're not, you were just too scared to come out. You were sexually assaulted men. So don't, good don't point. give them their, 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 an out there that's, yeah. Good point. I should, good point. Thank you for, yes, quantifying that. But yeah. But that was a very different world then. Very different world. 
Um, but like, so for people on the radio, so someone on the radio station thought like, hey, if we just hold a spotlight up to them, it's gonna, but what, so what is your ideas, what are your thoughts on like platforming? You know, this gets used a lot now. Yeah. It's like you shouldn't platform ideas or do you think platform, like it's okay to have people on or do you think you shouldn't because you don't want to platform their ideas? I think like, it's okay to have people on. I think it's okay to people have. Because um, you had, um, so you're on the left, right? You yeah. Had, um, I had Janine Pirro on. Pirro I had Janine Pirro from Fox News on my show. You had that very controversial sheriff. Um, oh, our, our Sheriff Arpaio. Yeah. Arpaio out of uh, Arizona. Who, who made, yeah, who, who uh, made them sleep outside in pink tents. If we just get tough with these people, They'll never want to come back here. When the truth is, if we give these people job skills, maybe they won't have to come back here. But All right, speaking of that, is Elijah here? Uh, yeah. That's what that's position that's did you play? Center. Okay. He's a, he's a state champion. <laughs> he's a state champion. No, no. All right. Um, ask your first question, Elijah, about the, uh, the controversial speakers. It kind of builds up over this. How do you carry yourself for dealing with possibly controversial speakers? Um, they tell lawyers never ask a question unless you already know the answer. Um, and in sports, before your championship, when last year in basketball, I'm sure you scouted your opponents so you know it was coming. So to put it in a sports analogy, um, scout your guest so you know it's coming and you have counter arguments prepared. Um, That's probably the closest sports analogy of anything I do on the radio. not here. I'm going to read Tazir's because I think it's a good one. Um, you kind of touched upon this already, but uh, Tazir asked, as a radio host, how, how do you navigate the balance between providing entertainment and delivering inform informative content, especially within the context of a nonprofit community radio station like WRA 1320 AM? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of a history buff, so the more information stuff I do is, is the history of things. Um, and how we got here today. But I do more entertainment and comedy than anyone else on the station, which is saying something, because Dave King can be pretty funny too. He's a comedian. Yeah, he's a comedian. Yeah. Um, but he did, he's more serious on the radio than I am. Um, um, he's also more political, I think, than anyone. Yeah, he's more political. Because um, Dave, it's funny, um, Dave doesn't care what you think about him. <laughs> And I guess because I was the sixth of seven kids and, you know, the house could be chaos and my role as a child was to make sure everyone was happy and laughing. Um, so my biggest fear in life is what if they don't like me? What if they think I'm a bass ball? What if they don't like me? Uh, Dave Kane uh, has none of those concerns. <laughs> if you don't like me, go pound sand. I like myself. Um, so I, I try to be a little more sensitive. So the, that's why I keep the political stuff, the current... Today, I hate our 45th president with a burning passion, and if you don't, what in God's name is the matter with you? There's only two reasons to support him. You're stupid or you're evil. Um, try to keep that to the last half hour of the show. <clears throat> um, sorry, sorry. Just so I don't completely annoy the audience. Sorry, no, no. By the way, that's true. I'm not sorry, because it's true. <laughs> um, before 11.30, most of the real stuff I talk about is more historical based than currently based. Um, Watch speeches of Hitler and Mussolini and see who they sound exactly like. Hmm, how does this work? Um, Eddie Cooley, do you want to ask you a question about uh, social political problems? Uh, I'm, I'm Peter's name. Okay, so he asked, are there any social or political problems that affect how you do your job on a daily basis? Eddie, you're very articulate. <laughs> I'm sorry, read the question again. I was thinking of the punchline, not listen to the question. Are there any social or political problems that affect how you do your job on a daily basis? Our 45th president. Next question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I said it at the very, very beginning. Uh, it's easy to live in a dictatorship. You've got no role, no choice in your government, no role in your government. The United States of America, I hope you know this, we are the longest, most successful experiment in a form of government, a democratic republic, in the history of the world. The Greeks invented it, it lasted less than a century. The Romans used it, it lasted less than a century. 
and they both became empires, or in, or in the state of Greece, city-states. We're the longest, most successful experiment in a democratic republic form of government. People have a choice. What you think matters, who you vote for matters, and we take it for granted. That's why immigrants who come to this country and who have to pass citizens' tests, who have to learn about our culture, and for the first time in their lives have choices that they never had before. That's why they make some of the best Americans, because they appreciate what they have. I, us, we all take for granted that, we, again, I said earlier, 115 billion people have lived. Less than a billion, maybe what? Half a million people? 750 million people? Have had the chance, out of 115 billion, have had the chance to live in this form of government. And we are this close, this close, next November, to throwing it all away. That's why I get so dramatic about it. And that's why I sometimes turn into an angry white man in the radio, which doesn't entertain anyone. Um, but so fortunately, I have listeners who will text in, AWM, angry white man, and then um, get back to lighter stuff. Gabrielle, uh, can you ask you? Uh, yeah, it was a question about like other media. Yeah. yeah. Um, during your career as a radio host, have you ventured into other avenues of media, and what are they? Yeah, TV. I did a lot of, um, again, pre- uh, uh, Pre-internet, uh, for instance, high school sports. The big games are on Friday night. Uh, and for 11 years on Sports Channel, uh, I was part of the, um, um, uh, what was it called? New England High School Football something. Or, and, then, uh, so, uh, and then in the other seasons, the show was called Scholastic Sports. But I got to cover the game of the week for 11 years. You know, the biggest games, high school games in uh, football, uh, basketball and hockey in the winter, um, and I had a very, very different approach because um, you know, I would um, sometimes be intentionally obtuse, um, you know, because I'm reporting on the game and learning about the game, and I'd say things that would uh, be funny or make myself the butt of the jokes many times. For five years, uh, from 1998 through 2002, I was part of the uh, Friday Night American Hockey League Game of the Week. Uh, with Hall of Famer Fred Cusick on play-by-play, -play, Hall of Famer Brad Park on color commentary, and who the heck is Paul Healy uh, doing player interviews and between period features. Um, and so I did that for a year, I did it straight, and then the second year, in a production meeting, which we had before every game, um, geez, I want to try to do something a little more comic. And I remember Fred Cusick saying, comedy on live TV is very, very difficult. But I started doing more comic things and it started working. Um, and my sister uh, was a nurse in the Air Force uh, living in Biloxi, Mississippi, and she said, hey, we have a hockey team. So I created a character, um, which I probably couldn't get away with today, um, you know, stuffed a pillow under my shirt, wore a ridiculous loud tie, sports coat, and, you know, howdy, my name's Biloxi Bob from W-O-N-O, -O. whoa, no, sports radio in Biloxi, Mississippi. Good news is we got ourselves a hockey team. Bad news is nobody knows the dang rules. And then I just went to different fans, it's on live TV asking them questions about the game. You know, what's that cow chip? They're knocking around on the ice. Oh, that's a puck. You watch the language. We're on you know, live TV. And, uh, which one's the quarterback? Uh, hockey doesn't have a quarterback. Some where I come from, if it ain't got an engine, a rifle, or a quarterback, it ain't no sport. Um, so that was probably the peak of my career uh, in, in TV. And what else? So, um, and then, the, you know, the live improv stuff. So that's so as which again, self praise is no praise, but I killed. So someone I who killed. was educated in theater. Yeah. Is that like the, the only acting you've done professional is like being a character at like either on radio or in these TV things? Is that your is that your acting outlet? I guess so. I guess I'm. Yeah. 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 Have you been in a movie or a, or a short film or TV show as, as like no. actually acting? No. No. Yeah. No. Okay. But. But again, like my radio show was very, very different than your average shows, and what I did on TV was, you know, pretty. You know, when you watch sports, or you know, people don't try to. Very few people try to report on the sports and be funny at the same time. And when it, when it's good, it's very good, and when it's bad, it was a swing and a miss. But. All right. So I'm gonna ask one more question. Just do this one quickly, and then we'll do like a wrap up. Okay. And I'm gonna give you two choices of the wrap up. Whether you want to just answer this one question, which I think is a good wrap up, or if you want to. Um, 
just to give you a wrap up, whatever. So the first question is, um, what steps do you have to take to make sure, this is from Elijah, what steps do you have to take to make sure that you meet FCC regulations? Like, ah. com, like on a regular basis, I guess, or however you want to answer it. I've only accidentally used the F-bomb twice on the air in my career. Uh, that's the big one to avoid. Um, what if other people do it when you're posting? Let's say something that I'm posting. What, you, what is your... Oh, you have a dump button. Uh, what the dump button is, is uh, you hit the dump button because when you're listening to the radio, it's, it's not, it, they say it's live, but it's technically not live. Uh, like on my show, I, when I say it, you don't hear it till 42 seconds later because it's going to go through the processing of the machine. So if I say something or a guest says something inappropriate, a swear or something, or in support of Mambla, um, I can hit the dump button and then that eliminates. The audience will never hear it. Um, so that's, that's the biggest safeguard. And then mind your P's and Q's, that's the other one. You just your software here. Do you want to explain how on a technical level how that works? Like the dump button? I have a flip phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a softball for him. That's, Dave that's would have a better idea. idea. No, I, I, honestly, I think it's just, um, I think it's a recording buffer. You just kind of, I mean, that's not even a good idea. I thought he would know that. Is that, is that technically like a software thing? Like you can just like yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was even analog technology. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I don't know how it works, but the broadcast is delayed at the station somehow before it's sent out over the air. So you have time to recover from a mistake. Yeah. And it goes, it, um, it's not precise. So like it'll go back, what's it like a 10 second block? Eight. Eight seconds. So it's always, it goes eight seconds before you press it. Yeah. So uh, you press it and you're like, oh, rewind eight seconds or just cut out eight seconds of what we just said. Um, that's how you make sure. Um, so. I filled in for his show one day, and the station manager, who should know better, um, so just to give you a little, this brief little history, before they were an AM station, they were an internet radio station, so they were just putting that music was before on me. any music. Yep. Um, no, yes, they were that New England Free Radio, so before, that's what it was originally built as, was New England Free okay. Radio. So there was this, this um, cause the Jay Robertson was just an hour a day of that, or whatever, okay. that, yeah, or a few hours. So um, New England Free Radio had, just played, it played any music, swears, whatever, it didn't matter. So they uploaded all this music into their servers, but they kept them there when they became the AM radio, who's now uh, under the rules under of, the the FCC. of the FCC. So there was a guy who was work, who worked at, there's a TV station attached, who was a huge Guns N' Roses fan, and so, and I'm friends with him and the station manager is. So he says, oh, in honor of James, we're gonna play some Guns N' Roses, and he plays the live version of uh, Welcome to the Jungle, uh -huh. if any of you guys have ever heard this. But it starts with, do you know where the fuck you are? And it's just like, so then, and we didn't have the dump button yet. So it just went out. <laughs> so it just went out, like, you know, and huge FCC violation, you know? Just to so, give you an idea, yeah. but just to give you an idea that yeah. some of the, because again, we do some deadly serious topics and then some ridiculously silly stuff. Yesterday, uh, we got in the subject, somehow, I don't even remember, of pistachio nuts. And, um, are they nuts? Are they legumes? I don't know. I'm not sure. But you know, the pistachio nuts, someone you know, wrote in and said they, they only get pistachio nuts out of the shells, which is cheating. Half of the fun is breaking them out of the shells. But there's always some where the nut is sealed and you can't get at it. So Agent uh, Six texted in, um, oh, rats. there's always a rogue dentist who slips one of those fully sealed pistachio nuts into a bag trying to generate business. Um, and that's, oh God. When they're dyed red, and then after eating a bag of pistachios, you couldn't get the red off your hand for several days. Um, we once, the most calls I ever got on one subject was eight calls in 22 <coughs> minutes. You know what the subject was? Which way does toilet paper go on the roll? <laughs> over the top, obviously. What kind of insane person puts it around the back? It only goes over the top, which is why whenever I go to anyone's house and have to use the bathroom, I flip the toilet paper around. Because you know, in a couple hours, the wife's going to be yelling at the husband for again putting the toilet paper on wrong. And the poor schmuck is completely innocent. Nice. Um, I was going to say... Uh, <laughs> but we're out of time. Say, right, we're out of time, but um, <coughs> if you wanted to quickly... Uh, you either can wrap it up for yourself, or you can answer Candy's question, which is... It's, 
what was your most memorable experience on radio station, and what was that radio station? Well, that should be like a one minute. Uh, very quickly, um, no. 2015, uh, two Rep uh, Republican senator, Trent Lott, and a Democratic senator, who I so apologize, I can't remember their name, uh, they wrote a book about bringing our country together again. And it was unbelievably uh, positive, optimistic book. Uh, two US senators on my show at the same time. It was a great interview. And then came Trump, and so much for that. Rats. And now we've never been more divided. Okay. And this is my boss, Jim Jones, calling. This country? Not since the Civil War. Good point. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.